class. I know. Okay. Okay, so we left off last time talking about speciation and mentioning that there are two different forms of it, if you will, right? There's allopatric. Do you remember this? This is, I was actually projecting the slides here. And then what was the other one? Sympatric. Sympatric. So we've got allopatric and we have sympatric. Allopatric literally means different country. And sympatric then means what? Same, same. same country. Man, that is some great critical thinking there. Is it Latin? Is this Latin? Yes. No. Is it Greek? Yes. It's Greek? All right. So, what does this mean? Somebody explain this to me. Shh. Unless you're going to explain this to me, you don't need to be talking. What's that, what does this mean, that it's a different country? Yeah, Katie. They're geologically isolated. Right, so first we get geographic isolation. It could be geological. Geographic isolation, and then... You get the reproductive isolation. Your geographic isolation happens first, separating them into two different countries. Not maybe literally, but separating them from each other geographically. Sympatric speciation, they're in the same space. Lydia. And then, like, they're, so they're not geographically isolated, but then, like, they, because of, like, partitioning and stuff, there's, like, character displacement. Yeah, so, well... So now with character displacement and niche partitioning, usually that happens when you already have them as separate species and then they're reintroduced to the same area. So to actually generate the two separate species to begin with, we need some mechanism. Because this one, our mechanism is this geographic isolation. This one, we have to have some means by which you can reproductively isolate them. So there's a couple ways you can do that. One of them is um, called polyploidy. Polyploidy. Can you read that? I know this marker, this marker isn't, isn't, isn't great. Bless you. So we've got polyploidy, and what this is, is more than two copies of the genome. So if an individual or say a group of individuals for some reason or by some mechanism gets more than two copies of the genome, that can reproductively isolate them from a group, bless you, that has two copies of the genome. And it's because when um, the cells go to fuse and the chromosomes would line up during the next cell division, the chromosomes don't line up properly. They don't line up properly. Okay? So there are different means by which you can gain more than one copy of uh, the genome. Some of it happens by a hybridization event. Two different species hybridize to get uh, more than two copies of the genome. And sometimes it happens within a single species, and so you can see those different terms. Auto means same, so auto polyploidy means that you've got more than two copies from just within the same species. Allo uh, means different or separate, and so allo polyploidy is when uh, you get some kind of hybridization event. All right, can you think of any other mechanisms by which we can get reproductive isolation, even if the two organisms are in the same place. Lydia, you gave us an idea of niche partitioning and uh, character displacement. The only way this works is if something new opens up. You end up getting a new ecological niche. And then so the same group can spread into that new niche while also staying in the old niche. Okay, that make sense? 
So here, another way this can happen is with a new niche. New niche appears. So some members in that group will go and will occupy that new niche while other members of the group remain in the old niche. Okay? You'll see this a lot with introduced plant species where an original, say, a, an insect species will, part of that population will go and use this new food source. The remaining portion of the population will stay on the old food source. And so you end up getting that habitat uh, isolation, right? Which is prezygotic, postzygotic. What is habitat isolation? Is it a prezygotic isolation or postzygotic? Carrie? Yeah, so it prevents them from reproducing. All right, is this okay? Can you think of any other mechanisms that might do this? So we open up a new niche. Some of the group goes to use the new niche. Can you think of other mechanisms by which this might happen? Yeah, Emma. So there's some there's there's you're getting you're getting you're getting close. Uh, the another one where this often happens or proposed to have happened is through sexual selection. And so this is where you get either competition between males or among males, or you get mate choice. Um, actually driving uh, driving some differences in the species. <laughs> Bless you. Driving some differences. And if those differences become extreme enough, uh, you can actually split them into two different species. So I want to give you a, an example of St. Patrick's speciation in action. Yeah, what if, right. like... Um, I think you gave this example last class, but I don't know if it was for the same thing, like predation, and there's like two like different colors or something. Oh, and so you've got frequency-dependent selection? Yeah. Yeah, and so if there's enough pressure to drive those two apart, right? So in that, in that example, you're, you're referring to how do we maintain a, what you call a balanced polymorphism to where you have two different color morphs and both are reasonably abundant, and that's because the rarer form may not be eaten or preyed upon as heavily as the other. But if there's enough of kind of a, a female mate choice to where the, say, the, the, the color that's more common is chosen by females that are that color, the color that's less common is chosen by females of that color, if you, and then now you've got potential for reproductive isolation, right? If a female is brown, she's going to choose a brown male. If a female is tan, she's going to choose a tan male, right? And so if you can generate enough behavioral isolation, then absolutely, we can generate two separate species. So again, with all of this, just like what we talked about with microevolution, the variation has to already be in place. We're not talking about how do we get variation. We're talking about given we already have variation, how do you accomplish something with it, right? How do you change the allele frequencies or shift them in a particular direction? Or more extreme, how do you generate reproductive isolation and produce two separate species where there used to be one? Okay? So I want to give you an example of St. Patrick's speciation in action. So do you all know what orcas are? Yeah. Killer whales, orcas, yes. whatever you want to call them. So there is, uh, orcas have almost a global distribution. Now, there are separate populations in, in various oceans, uh, but basically in almost all of their populations, we're watching a St. Patrick's speciation event happen based on behavioral isolation. So you have uh, orcas typically, like other porpoises uh, and other toothed whales in general, are fish feeders. They eat fish, and they use echolocation to find fish, but you've got in almost all of our population of orcas, you're, you're having a subset that's starting to take advantage of a new niche. And that niche is feeding on whales. 
feeding on other toothed whales, feeding on dolphins, feeding on other orcas, feeding on small toothed whales. And so they're no longer using their echolocation because that would clue the toothed whale into their location and they're feeding on toothed whales. So you're starting to get a behavioral isolation and the individuals that feed on whales are not reproducing with the individuals that are continuing to feed on fish. And so you've got a behavioral isolation that is developing to separate these into two different species. Yeah. And they also sometimes feed on sharks as well. Sure. Yeah. Sharks fall under, yeah, I mean, the, the fish eaters typically will eat all sorts of different things, including sharks. Usually small sharks, although they hunt in packs. So they've got no problem taking on a, a big prey item. Yeah, Kyle? If they don't use the echolocation, then how are they finding the other? Vision. Sight. They see okay. I mean, the problem is, is ocean water is notoriously what you call turbid. It's hard to see in. Um, but you, I mean, you can see in it. Uh, and, and, I mean, they, they hunt in groups. And so what they're doing is they are basically trapping toothed whales in like a particular area and then and then attacking it yeah so and it's not hard to find a toothed whale they're massive yeah. right they're eating things that are much bigger versus if you're eating fish those are a little bit more complicated to find relying just on sight all right yeah mark um like how, how did they um has an orca ever went up against like a great white shark? I don't know. I, I mean, I'm I'm sh I'm sure you can find some documentation of it. I I don't know though. Yeah, Tori. So the behavior of like whales eating other toothed whales, so that's like a learned thing. Yeah. Like, yeah, a lot of the hunting behaviors in toothed whales in general are learned. Have you ever seen a video of a killer whale beaching itself? to get a seal or something and pull it back into the ocean. Yeah. So you'll see a lot of them will do that, and that's something they have to learn how to do. Their mom will actually teach. Usually the moms will teach the offspring how to hunt. And you get the offspring are really bad at hunting initially and have a lot of... Excuse me, Tori. Yeah. Hey, can you put my dragons away? Dragons? Is it safe for me to come in? Yes. Uh, and I saved this from the dragon. So, uh, yeah, all, all hunting behavior uh, tends to be, uh, tends to be learned. It's, it's, I mean, as far as their prey choice, that tends to be partially innate. Like, they, they've got just um, something inside them that tells them they want it, and they don't know exactly why. I mean, I'm sure they know why. It's because they're hungry. Um, <laughs> But as far as how to hunt, a lot of that is learned. And especially if you're going to learn how to hunt other whales and not use your echolocation, something you have the physiological capability of doing, that is certainly learned. So isn't that, like, is that natural for a whale to eat another like, whale? Why, why is that happening? Uh, because it's a food source that nothing else is taking advantage of. And so it's it's a it's a it's a way of avoiding competition, right? I mean, you can look at it as it's partitioning the niche, right? You have all these different things you can eat, especially if you're going to hunt in a pack. I mean, if you're going to hunt in a pack, you can almost eat anything. You know, you ever watched a, a, a lion pride take on like a giraffe or an elephant or a hippopotamus? It's a lot of work. But if you're gonna hunt in a in a pride, you can make it happen, Lydia. Um, so like, what is that kind of like thinking process without using all? Because they're in a way like using out like the oh, this is a food source. No one else is using that food source. Maybe we should try to go after that food source without the like problem solving. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's, you know, it's hard to know. Um, it's, it's not, so you're like, where does it fall under this? Um, I, I don't know. I, and because the thing is, is, is it can happen without there being much thought, right? I mean, it can happen almost by accident. Um, like you have a pod happen to cross a, um, a, an injured toothed whale and then they just eat it because it's simple. And then all of a sudden, that's just something that they do. Um, it's definitely learned behavior. And so that's a more sophisticated type of, you know, behavior than just associative behaviors um it's certainly learned but as far as is it cognition or not i don't know yeah i don't know it's a good question yeah Emma. Um, is there any like, particular reason why like, people chose orcas? <laughs> uh i i don't i don't know please excuse me yeah i'm just trying to think in inconspicuously <laughs> sure so i i don't i don't know um I imagine it, it likely started um, <laughs> it likely started as a rehabilitation uh, program and then from there it became a means by which you could do research on toothed whales right because I mean you can't it's really difficult to try to do that research in the wild but if you have them in captivity dragons. capture the dragons capturing dragons uh, <laughs> If you if you have them in captivity, I mean you're limited in what you can do, but at least you can work on them. So I imagine it probably started with rehabilitation. Uh, they are fairly easy to get because they're almost globally distributed. So. What is right. Oh, a lot of things. If it's both are correct. Actually, both are correct. You can do octopi or octopuses. Yeah. Moose. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Sorry. Why is the plural of house, houses and not heist? I don't know. It's, it's different. It's probably different sources to the words. They came from different sources. But I don't know. All right. There's one more thing we need to talk about from 24. Okay. But before we go to that one more thing we need to talk about from 24... I want to know if there are any questions on allopatric versus sympatric speciation. You feel like you have it down. And last time we, I asked you which is more common and it's overwhelming. Uh, the evidence is overwhelming that allopatric speciation is the main means by which speciation happens. So you get geographic isolation, then you get reproductive isolation. Although there are some examples of sympatric. So what we need to talk about now is the post- zygotic isolation mechanisms, hybridization. Is that spelled right? Hybridization? Hybrid, I don't know. This just says, yeah. Did I forget the R again? Thank you. There we go. Hybridization. Yeah. So was allopatric and sympatric, they were types of pre-zygotic Um, Not necessarily. They could... Yeah, they can, they can be either, but if you're going to, um, you, yeah, you need to get some type of isolating mechanisms, either pre-zygotic or post-zygotic, okay. um, but what we're, we're just going to specifically focus in on, but yeah, the speciation can happen using either. Okay, but for hybridization? Hybridization, it's, it's going to be post-zygotic, because if hybridization literally means to take two species and combine them into one, right? So the, the pre-zygotic mechanisms are not in place. You're forming a zygote. That zygote is developing. Now the question is, what happens with that hybrid? Tori, did you have a question? Oh, no. I'm not sure. Oh, okay. Yeah. Emma, did you have a question? No? no? Okay. Cool. So uh, in hybridization, we tend to form what are called hybrid zones. Hybrid zones form at points of overlap. Now, here's the thing. Hybridization can only really happen with allopatric speciation, right? To where they, they were separated geographically, they developed some reproductive isolation, and then they were allowed to be brought back in the same space. Because if they have always been in the same place, 
which is sympatric speciation, and they're still hybridizing. They've never speciated, right? They've never been reproductively isolated. Now, you could argue, well, if they're hybridizing at all, they've never been reproductively isolated, period, right? They're still forming offspring, but then we have to pay attention to what happens uh, to these, these, these hybrids. Yeah, Trinity. So, so it's almost like mostly common with allopatric Well, it can really only happen with allopatric speciation to where they were, they were isolated geographically, and then there's some place where they're coming back together. Because if they never separated in the first place, we can't really call this a hybrid zone. They're still just the same species if they're reproducing, right? They've never, they've never separated. And so with allopatric speciation, if they've separated geographically and they're not fully reproductively isolated yet, and then they come back together, you could, if you wanted to, argue they're not two separate species. Although what you find is the hybrids, again, we, we talked about this, right? We've got hybrid breakdown, where the hybrid it has good viability, it has good fertility, but it just for some reason isn't quite right, right? It doesn't, it doesn't persist for long generations, okay? Make sense? Okay, so in these hybrid zones, one of three things happen. One of three things happen in these hybrid zones, and this is where you, you, you have two different species but they don't have any prezygotic isolations. They are, they are forming zygotes. Those zygotes are developing into adults. And the adults, so this, this is gonna be in the case where they're still fertile, they're still viable, right? They survive just fine, they reproduce just fine. But this is kind of in that category of potential hybrid breakdown. Although we have basically three options that can happen in these hybrid zones. One is reinforcement. And this, we've seen this before, this is character displacement. This is very squeaky. I mean, not very squeaky, but it's squeaky. Okay, so reinforcement, character displacement. Here in the hybrid zone, they may hybridize, but that hybridization is only working to reinforce keeping these two species separate. Okay, and then over time, these species become more and more and more different, okay? More and more and more different. So reinforcement, it's reinforcing the reproductive isolation, okay? We're getting character displacement. We've seen this before, right? As a result of competition between those two species. What's another option that could happen in these hybrid zones? <laughs> another option is fusion. Another option is fusion, and this is to become one. This is very Genesis 1, right? Is it Genesis 1 or Genesis 2 where it talks about the two flesh become one? Genesis 2. Genesis 2, for sure. So in this case, the two separate species fuse into a single species. You eliminate all of the isolation. So it goes from initially at this point of contact, you probably have hybrid breakdown, but over time they actually fuse back into one species. Okay, that makes sense? So this one, it reinforces the reproductive isolation and they become more and more isolated through character displacement. This one is over time they actually mold into, back into a single species. Carry. Yes. Okay. Yep. And so you'll see it a lot. And so we, we talked about initially, do you, do you remember the organisms we used as our, an example for character displacement? We used finches on the Galapagos Islands. So there are some small islands that only contain a single species of finch. There are some larger islands in the archipelago where multiple species live on the same island. And so what's probably happened there is species that have formed on smaller islands have both migrated to bigger islands because of the ability for multiple species to exist there. And then so now you have this potential, you have this hybrid zone, and you can either have reinforcement. This is going to be by far the most common thing to happen. That's why we talked about it earlier, 
right? You get two closely related species. In order to avoid competition, they will partition the niche. You'll get character displacement. They'll become more different, and it will reinforce the reproductive isolation. This is by far the most common. This one right here is probably the next most common of fusion, and that's that they mold, they merge back into a single species, Trinity and then Kyle. Does like hybridization only happen like in captivity? No, no. Although we can make it happen in captivity through um, artificial insemination, so a lot of our hybrids that we do research on, we we produce through artificial insemination. Because you can get beyond the temporal habitat and behavioral isolation by using artificial insemination, right? Like, so a lion and a tiger, they're never going to reproduce in the wild because there's nowhere where they both live in the wild. But you can take the sperm of a lion and inseminate a tiger and form a, that would be a liger. Or you can take the sperm of a tiger and inseminate a lion and you get a tigon. Tigon. Usually, yep, usually. Yeah, this is the most common thing that happens in these hybrid zones is reinforcement. Yeah, because they already were geographically separated, so they've started to develop reproductive isolation. They've come together in this hybrid zone. They're not fully reproductively isolated yet, but usually over time they finish that reproductive isolation because of the reinforcement. Sorry, we've got to go Kyle, and then we can go Emma. So does this mean that they were originally the same? Yes. Yes, infusion. You're talking about infusion? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, they were the same species. They split through allopatric speciation, right? They became geographically isolated, developed some reproductive isolation. They come back together, and in the space where they come back together, they're fusing into a single species. So it has to be through allopatric to be through this. Well, I mean, in sympatric, it just would be hard to accomplish this, right? to where they become enough isolated in the same space and then start reproducing again in the same space. It's like, it just, it, it, it's like nothing really happened. Yeah. yeah. And, and so you can have fusion and still maintain two separate species in different places. It's just in the hybrid zone they fused back to what the original species was like. But in all the other places, they could still be separate species. Right? This happens with wolves and coyotes. So the, uh, the red wolf is a hybrid between wolves and coyotes. So wolves and coyotes used to be a single species. I don't know how long ago, but they used to be a single species. They became two separate species, probably through allopatric speciation. And then in areas where they overlap, they're, they're hybridizing and they're, 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 they're forming a single species again. They're fusing, but only in the place of overlap. And not in all of their places of overlap, just in certain places. Yeah, Michelle. Fox and... No. No. Yeah, Emma. Um, you're looking for isolation mechanisms. So, like, if you hybridize two individuals, you're looking for, do they have reduced viability, right? Do they survive worse than either of the species do? on their own? Do they reproduce worse than either of the species do on their own? And then are you going to see evidence of breakdown? Like if they survive just as well and they reproduce just as well, can they form a sustainable population, right? So that's one thing you're looking at. Another thing that they do is what's called uh, the, the idea of forming what are tr transgenic animals, although with those you're usually genetically modifying them. But with other hybrids, it's like maybe we're, we we can build something that's more hardy. So they do this a lot with plants. A lot of plants, they'll do hybrid stuff to try to make a more hardy line of that that's going to grow better. So let me give you an example of that, and then we'll go Isa and then Trinity. Um, the American chestnut uh, almost disappeared from its range in the United States because of blight, a parasite, a parasitic infection. And so what they did was they hybridized the American chestnut with the Chinese chestnut, which was a more hardy species, and then planted those hybrids, and those hybrids are more resistant to the blight and are surviving better. Yeah. Isa. Okay, so dogs. Uh-huh. Like what kind of dogs? Jogs in general or domestic dogs? Domestic. Okay. So those are one species, right? 
Well, so those are the same, yes, and they're the same species as wolves. So, they're all Canis lupus. Okay, so let's say we were doing um, like a chihuahua and a poodle. Like that's, that's not hybridization. That's not hybridization. No. Nope. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and even if you were going to do a dog with a wolf, it's not hybridization because they're a single species. Really? Yeah. What would a dog and a wolf look like? Uh, <laughs> like, like a, and so what I is, mean, what like, a, like a wolf. A a uh, coyote. coyote. So you can you can do you can hybridize dogs and coyotes like in the same mean, way. Uh huh. Like for example, tigers and lions. Those can. Mean yeah. Well, th we can do it artificially. They 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 won't actually mate. They I mean they'll kill each other. But can you do dogs on each other? Yes. Uh huh. Yes. So would a tiger and lion be different species? Right? Well, they're they're related, but they're different species. They, wa they won't reproduce. We can make it happen through artificial insemination, um, but, but it won't happen. And then the ligers and the tigons have reduced viability and reduced fertility. They, they are very clearly not good hybrids, but they're massive. I mean, so, so tigons, tigons can be huge. Some tigons can stand like eight feet tall at the shoulders. I mean, they're, they're, they're enormous. Trinity and then Emma, you had something, Trinity. You forgot Emma, sorry. Um, what's the difference between a tigon and a liger? So a tigon is when the dad is a tiger, a liger is when the dad is a lion. Is it like the same? No, not at all. Really? Yeah, so not at all. Like you can tell. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'll show you, I'll show you after, after we finish this. Yeah. Uh, a tigon, the tiger is the father. I'll show you. I'll show you a picture of both. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I know it's weird that, but they look, I'll show you, they look, at, they look completely different. And it, it probably has a, so sex is determined in lions and tigers the same way it's determined in humans. It's presence or absence of the Y chromosome. And so that's what's influencing the difference is there are, there are characteristics on that Y chromosome for both species that are displayed based on who the dad is, right? So a liger's got the Y chromosome from a lion. A tiger, a tigon has the Y chromosome from a tiger. Yes, absolutely, completely. Michelle and then Rick. Um, I'm still kind of confused on the gender. Is it like male figure? On the general definition of, of what? Um, so hybridization is when you have two species mate together. That are mating together. So that's all. Yeah. All right, so the third option. Oh, yeah, sorry, Rick. Okay, so Shh. if you were to have a ligon. Wait, liger or tigon. Liger and tigon, whatever. Okay. Now, if you were to combine those two, maybe yeah, it'd be a ligon. Could you get... Could you no, they're just, just like a tiger or just a lion? They're, they're sterile, though, is oh. the thing. Oh, okay. So they, they, don't, they don't produce gametes. Actually, I think they actually got a tigon to produce gametes and then, and then mated that with a, like a tiger or a lion. But, I mean, they, they have extremely reduced fertility. Okay. But if, like, you took another hybrid and you, like, crossed the two different hybrids, could you just get, like, back to, like... The first one, I guess? Yeah, I mean, it would be, so, like, if you, let's say you hybridized a wolf with a coyote. Uh -huh. And then you just kept, you kept mating that hybrid with wolves. Yeah. Eventually, you're going to breed the coyote out. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, the last one is stabilization. This is the rarest of all three options, if you will. Uh, this is the rarest of all three options. And uh, it's basically, they maintain their current level of reproductive isolation, and they don't fuse back together, and they don't reinforce it and get, become more different. They just, they just kind of stay the same. This is, this is very rare, okay? Usually they either become more different, or they fuse into a single species in the hybrid zone. They don't usually maintain this, like, certain level of reproductive isolation. Yeah, Trinity. So it may do, yeah, well, they do, but rarely, and they're, like, partially reproductively isolated. So this would be, like, say they, they're forming, they keep mating to form these hybrids that are sterile. 
you know, and that's where you'd have so one example the, with the other species. They don't make it then Correct. Although if they're going to fuse, then they would. So they don't make with the. They make with the. Okay, hold on, confusing So in these hybrid zones, they're going to continue to mate with members of their own species. Yeah. But they're also mating with members of the other species in these hybrid zones. Uh, it's only fusion if the two become one species again, to where there's no longer in that hybrid zone two different species. They're all just oh. one species. And then reinforcement is if eventually they, they, they stop reproducing altogether. They stop forming hybrids. And then stabilization. So here they stop forming hybrids. Here they stop forming hybrids because you just get one species. It's no longer a hybrid. It's just... There's not two different species, and sometimes they hybridize together. There's one species now. And then in here, they would keep hybridizing. They, they'd hybridize sometimes, and then sometimes they mate with just members of their species. And it just kind of stabilizes this weird relationship. And that doesn't happen very often. So stabilization is kind of like the middle ground? Yes, between the two. Yep. Can you teach about hybridizing? Yep. All right. So we're going to bridge this to 25, and then we'll do our lecture break. It's got to be close. Oh, yeah, it's already close to 9. Yay. All right. I'm hungry. No, it's because I'm hungry, and I have the normal language school either. You hurt me. No, no, you're the best. All right. So the, the last thing, and this is going to bridge 24 to 25, is... Um, what does the fossil record show? This is the this is still chapter twenty four, but it's bridging it to twenty five. And it, it's basically this question here: What does the fossil record show, as far as speciation is concerned? We have examples of speciation, just like we have examples of microevolution in action. Allele frequency is changing. Right? You saw that in lab. You're like, yeah, I saw it happen. I ate the pretzel uh, goldfish, and we shifted it towards the cheddar. No, we, we, no, 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 we liked, we liked the pretzel, right? We were, in our natural selection, we were eating the cheddar, right? Yeah. And, 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 but what does the fossil record show? So we can see speciation happening. But the question is, what does the fossil record show as far as the history of speciation is? What the fossil record shows is species appear abruptly often with no intermediate. So the fossil record shows species appearing abruptly, often with no intermediate to connect them to another species. And so if this is going to drive all of the diversity of life that you have, right? Which if you don't have a creator, the only mechanism by which you have to derive all of the diversity of life are naturalistic processes, right? If you don't have a creator, would you agree? So if you don't have a creator, all of the diversity of life had to originate through naturalistic processes, which means all of your species probably have to root back to a single ancestral life form. And then you're like, okay, if that is true, we should be able to trace all of the events, or maybe not all of them, but many of the events in which we had one life form that split into two, right? We should be able to trace these speciation events. We see them happen. We should be able to trace this in the fossil record. The problem is, is you can't. What you see in the fossil record is species appear abruptly, often, we should say usually, with no intermediate, with no way to connect them to other life forms. And so much so that this was a challenge, and it is a challenge, to the dominant idea of descent with modification, of Darwin's idea. And so you had some evolutionists propose a different mechanism and that mechanism is called punctuated equilibrium. Punctuated equilibrium. And I'll write that on the board in a second. Lydia and then Trinity. Um, what does the fossil 
The thing about the fossil record is you can use it as support for whatever view of origins you have. There's, there's stuff from the fossil record that will support a young Earth, young Earth creationist view. There's evidence from the fossil record that will support a more long age creationist perspective. There's evidence from the fossil record that will support descent with modification from a single species. The fossil record, it, it, it's, it's got a lot in it, okay? But this, this is a problem for the idea that all life forms root back to a single type of life form. Is we have species appear abruptly, often, even usually, with no intermediate to connect them to other forms. Trinity, did you stop your question? Did you forget? Oh, um, why can't they see? Well, I mean, there are attempts to do that, and some of them are good, but I would, I would suggest the issues with doing that is because they don't all root back to a single life form. Oh. But that's because I believe that what the Bible teaches about creation is true, right? That God is responsible for some of the diversity of life. And so we should, well, not all, because I, I, I wouldn't say God is responsible for all the diversity of life, because that would mean that you know, wolves and coyotes and foxes, they were always separate creations. And I don't, I don't think that's the case. I think they were originally one life form that then diversified. And we'll talk about it with regards to humans as well. Trinity. Punctuated equilibrium. So somebody tell me what equilibrium means. From chemistry, right? So when a reaction reaches equilibrium, what's going on? Emma. So you are forming product at the same rate at which that product is being converted back into reactants. So yeah, when, when you reach equilibrium, the reaction is still taking place, but the rate at which you're making product is the same at which the rate that that product is converting back into reactants. So overall, your, your amount of materials aren't changing. The amount of reactant you have is staying the same. The, react, the amount of product you have is staying the same. Okay? That's what happens when a chemical reaction reaches equilibrium. Right? Do you remember that? Y'all yeah. remember that. You're like, oh, man, I loved it. Okay? Well, if you have equilibrium in life forms, what, what that's meaning is you are basically have a period of stasis. Biological evolution is not happening but it is punctuated by rapid speciation events. That's this idea here, that for most of Earth's history, you have periods of stasis where things are not evolving. And then you have events that punctuate that equilibrium where you get rapid and dramatic biological evolution. And this is a way to cope with this, that species appear abruptly without intermediates, and you're like, well, yeah, if they're evolving really rapidly, then that's exactly what you would expect to find. Okay? That makes sense? And then we have to start talking about what is the mechanism of speciation. So we, are, we, we already know that it's, it's basically microevolution, right? Changes in allele frequencies that can generate reproductive isolation but it all has to root back to changes in the genetics of these organisms. Okay, and you have to keep that in mind. And so keep that in your mind, and then when we get into our chapter on inheritance, you'll remember that all of these speciation events have to root back to genetic differences. Unless, of course, they don't, if they root back to epigenetic differences. But that's, that's another story, more complicated, and is shifting all of the ideas of how this works. Yeah, Katie. Um, with the, with the punctuated equilibrium, would that mean that, so microevolution, it's slow and over like a long process of time, right? Yes, yes, yeah, so you would say that for the most part that is true, that microevolution is a very slow process in which you change allele frequencies, but there are some mechanisms by which you could rapidly speed that up and generate new species very quickly. Yes. Now, punctuated equilibrium oftentimes, just on the, on the whole, doesn't provide a mechanism by which that rapid change happens. It just says that it must happen this way and not gradually. 
the change must be rapid because that's what the fossil record shows. Okay. They may. All right. So chapter 25 introduces descent with modification applied on a, on a big scale. Okay, and so this is, chapter 25 is talking about this in the way of universal common descent. And here, what this means is that all species, all species, what does all mean? Everything. All means all. All species root back to a single life form. Okay, so chapter 25 introduces this idea, right? Chapter 23 was about microevolution, evolution within a population. Chapter 24 is about speciation. What happens if that evolution within a population generates reproductive isolation, right? And then 25 now is like, okay, can we extrapolate this through time and say that all of the diversity of life is the product of microevolution, essentially, extrapolated out and given enough time? Chapter 25 also talks about abiogenesis. And I want you to know these are two very different ideas, okay? Abiogenesis is the beginning of life. The beginning of life. Okay? So it's how do you get living cells from non-living material? How do you get organic compounds from inorganic compounds? So we have to answer questions like this. Where do cells come from? That's a wonderful question. According to the cell theory, cells only come from pre-existing cells. But at some point, you had to have your first cells, right? Well, let's think about it. So it's just Adam and Eve in the beginning. Where did the rest come from? The rest of the cells. So there's millions, billions of people now. Oh, they all, yeah, but all of the cells in your body originate as a single cell. What? In the yeah, the zygote. So that no matter could be created or destroyed. But it's it's it's, it's not. You're you're harnessing matter from food and converting it into matter that you use to build your body. So it all.